Yellow Brick Road. Decision making for storage of electronic records. I heard our two speakers at an Agara conference online, and I was so engrossed in what they were saying that I took zero notes. And all I put at the end of the session was, wow. So I needed to hear it again, and I hope you will enjoy this. Um, our speakers will explain their two year journey to standardize storage recommendations for different types of electronic records while embracing agency specific business processes, which sounds absolutely wonderfully textbook. Um, we have other uh, webinars coming up in April. It's taking action before it's too late, monitoring file formats for risk. And in May, it's, the re it's a report on the on preparing archives for records in email project um, with Nick Canizzo. We remind people to visit our resource center. There's all sorts of things available for you to take a look at. There's forms and step uh, processes and whatnot. Um, I found one there called examining attributes of open standard file formats for long-term preservation and open access, which would be one that would be very germane for today. We also have a series of online recordings on capturing email for preservation, managing protected records, and FAQs on BitRot, which is one of our more pop popular ones. We also wanted to remind you of some requests for proposal that are coming up and some meetings that you might find interesting. Um, internationally, there's DigiPres 22, which is doing a program on preserving legacy. And they're calling for proposals due April 25th. The Best Practices Exchange has called for proposals due by April 29th. And they're gonna be meeting live at the Tennessee State Library and Archives from Monday, September 26th to Wednesday, September 28th. And then New England archivists, they are having a spring 2022 unconference via Zoom uh, during the week of May 9th, and I don't have any more specifics than that. I want to thank our sponsor for this webinar, Preservica. We couldn't do this without the, the support of our sponsors. And now I want to introduce our presenters. Lauren Kelly, is the records program supervisor for Multnomah County, Oregon. She joined the county in 2016 as a records management analyst before taking on the role of program supervisor and records officer in 2018. In addition to supporting an incredible team, Lauren regularly collaborates with departments to advise on records retention, policy development, process improvement, and public records law. She promotes using plain language, digital accessibility, and human-centered design principles to improve employee and public interaction with records and information. Lauren is a certified records manager. She holds a Master's of Archives and Records Administration from San Jose University, San Jose State University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Integrative Biology from the University of California, Berkeley. Deidre Thiemann, Diamond Thiemann, I um, probably said it wrong. I apologize in advance. You got it right. <laughs> okay. Um, is currently the electronic records management analyst at Multnomah County Records Management and Archives. She holds an MLIS from the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee and is currently completing the University of Toronto's Records and Information Management Certificate, leading to ICRM's CRA. Prior to her arrival in Oregon, she spent almost 20 years in corporate archives, managing both archival and museum functions. Her professional interests include electronic records management, obviously, physical and digital preservation, outreach, and the intersections between archives, museums, libraries, and records programs. And I am going to mute myself and turn this over to Lauren and Deed. All 
Are you seeing my screen? Okay, looks good. It doesn't have the, uh, the green bar around it this time, indicating that it's <laughs> being shared. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our presentation, Follow the Yellow Brick Road, Decision-Making for Storage of Electronic Records. Uh, my name is Lauren Kelly, and I'm the Records Program Supervisor for Multnomah County, Oregon, and I'm joined today by Deidre Thienen, our Electronic Records Management Analyst. We are, a team of, we are part of a team of six, which also includes two archivists, a records management technician, and a records administration assistant. Today's session is about our two-year journey to standardize storage recommendations for different types of electronic records while continuing to embrace agency-specific business processes. We'll start with a brief introduction to our organization in order to provide context to the project. Next, we'll describe the situation that led us to consider creating this type of tool and why we thought a tool would be an improvement. Then we will describe the development process and lead you through the evolution of the tool from our original conception to the final product. Next, we'll provide a demonstration of the tool. And lastly, we'll discuss lessons learned and next steps and how we hope we can help our users answer the question, where should I store this? By the end of today's session, you will understand how to help your users identify key characteristics and desired functionality needed for interacting with their electronic records, develop a standardized process for making recommendations for compliant and useful record storage, and develop customizable tools to assist IT partners and business units to analyze their own records and make appropriate decisions. Multnomah County is located along the Columbia and Willamette Rivers along Oregon's northern border. We are home to a fifth of the total population of the state and include Portland and Gresham, two of the state's largest cities. The county employs more than 6,000 people and this workforce is distributed across 150 buildings as well as thousands of virtual home offices. Our records program of six supports our Board of County Commissioners and all departments whose work includes community services, public safety, justice, health and human services, and internal support services. We're providing this snapshot in order to illustrate the diversity of services and therefore the diversity of applications and software that support those services. At Multnomah County, records management activities are decentralized. This means that our team is responsible for providing guidance across the organization so that any office within any division within any department can manage their records in a way that balances their business needs with public records law and other regulatory requirements. Ideally, we also help them follow records and information management best practices. As you can imagine, this requires a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation on a variety of topics. And one common question is, where should I store these records? Employees approach us for three main reasons. First is that they are currently organizing their record, the way, that, excuse me, first is that the way they are currently organizing their records isn't working for their team, usually because too many items are moved or deleted. The second is that they're concerned they're potentially storing sensitive information such as personally identifiable information, protected health information, or criminal justice information in an inappropriate or non-compliant place. The third is that some folks are aware of public records law and want to know if there's anything they're missing or doing incorrectly. Traditionally, the way to determine the best place to store these electronic records is through a consultation. We can interview people and ask as many questions as needed to be able to provide sound advice. Back in 2018, our team was smaller, so I was the only person responsible for holding these conversations. It was then in the midst of feeling a bit overwhelmed and like I was repeating myself a lot that I first thought, is there a way to do this that is more efficient but no less effective? These conversations do have a certain level of complexity that seem like it might be difficult to replicate in another format. After all, the answer to one question might lead to any series of further questions, and our role is to use our subject matter expertise to synthesize the information and make a recommendation, right? However, it was also clear that certain patterns of responses tended to lead to the same recommendations. 
And while there is some subjectivity involved, we could see that managing active records is based more in functionality, business need, and requirements than expert judgment. Fast forward to 2019. Deidre and our digital archivist Paige Monlux joined the county, so it was suddenly possible to assemble a team to try to figure out if we could create such a tool. The three of us enlisted our colleague from a different department, Sarah May O'Brien Scott, and we were set. Could the four of us create a tool that makes the recommendation as accurately and appropriately as we would? Initially, we proposed a flowchart as a replacement or supplemental tool. After all, this type of consultation was a series of questions with further questions based on particular responses. We imagined that a person could journey along our flowchart and like Dorothy on the yellow brick road to Oz, our users would be on a path to the ultimate repository for their unique situations. With that vision in mind, I will hand it off to Deidre to talk about what the development process was like to build our yellow brick road. Thank you, Lauren. Now that you understand the context in which we work, we wanted to share a bit about a development process and some of the challenges and pitfalls we encountered along the way. It was obvious from our various case studies that consultations involved a records representative asking a series of questions and making a recommendation based on the answers that the users gave. So a flowchart seemed to be an obvious solution. Who doesn't love a good flowchart? We thought that anyone on the records team could use the flowchart to move through the questions and, depending on the answers, would consistently and repeatedly land on the same advice for an appropriate repository for the type of records the user had inquired about. In this way, we hope to reach the Emerald City, an improvement in the consistency of advice records offered, and to have a scalable solution. There would be no exceptions, and the answer would always be easy. Of course, it didn't work. Let me bring you along as we traveled down the yellow brick road. We began by identifying the endpoints for our flowchart. These endpoints represent the various electronic repositories that are readily available to staff at Multnomah County. Some of them are simply storage locations, while others are fully functional applications with very specific intentions for use. Please note that these are not system endorsements, they are simply systems in use at Multnomah County. Flowchart endpoints include our network drives, consisting of both shared drives accessed by members of a particular program and individual drives for staff to maintain their own records. These storage repositories are the oldest available at the county and have grown exponentially over time. Often, these drives are abandoned when an employee leaves the county. As of 2010, the county migrated to a Google environment at the enterprise level. So we also have shared and individual Google drives as options for record storage. One of the great advantages to Google storage is that at the time we began this project, it was unlimited storage with our enterprise licenses. But of course, as we long suspected and learned for certain in 2021, nothing stays free forever. Finally, we have records management and archives programs favored systems, our EDRMS, Microfocus's content manager, and our digital preservation system, Preservica. Our EDRMS is an excellent place to store short and long-term active and inactive electronic records, which will eventually be destroyed according to the appropriate retention series in our county's retention schedules. The system offers several advantages over network or Google storage, including powerful keyword, document content, and Boolean searching, sorting and filtering, access controls, and an in-system viewer. Perhaps most importantly, the system calculates date due for destruction so that records can follow up with record owners to get things disposed in a timely fashion. We've noticed that while programs have been getting better at understanding what official records are and that they need to keep them, there is often no disposition of records built into business processes, so they tend to sit on network and Google Drives long past the date when they should have been destroyed or transferred to archives. Our digital preservation system facilitates access and preservation to unchanging, inactive, permanent records through format migrations, metadata schema, and online access to the general public. 
On the slide, you see a public facing version of an artificial collection that we created for our virtual display. Obviously, as records people, we vastly prefer these two systems and recommend them whenever possible. But not all of our users want to move away from those repositories that are more familiar to them or have time to learn whole new applications. Since we are a program that recommends but does not require, we promote but do not force their use. Of course, we would also be remiss if we didn't acknowledge that thousands of public records are also created and continue to reside in place in different software as a service or SaaS systems, custom built applications and vendor based software. There was our first roadblock. How do you get a handle on all the different capabilities or more often lack thereof of all these different systems? Many of these are legacy systems that were acquired before there was a strong records management program in place or are required by outside agencies and business partners for collaboration and reporting. Additionally, since the county reviews software, but has no formal process for revoking access to denied or unapproved systems, rogue systems continue to be identified frequently. We work on this roadblock by participating in various IT meetings, such as our software and hardware review group or SHRAG, and our IT pipeline slash project governance group, where we raise records issues with systems being built internally or being acquired from external vendors. Awareness is rising, although Shrag is probably very tired of me saying, so those are actually public records and we need to make sure the system does X, Y, Z. Since we had other methods to address the SAS systems, we set those to the side for this project. With our endpoints identified, we began defining the characteristics of records that would affect their eligibility to be stored in a particular system. We looked again at our case studies for questions we'd asked in the past. Some of them included, how long do records need to be kept? Short-term, long-term, permanently? Do the records contain protected information that requires specific security measures? Do the records change over time? Are they transacted upon? Do staff need to access their records remotely and or when they are not logged into the county's network? Are the records essential? Do they protect the legal and financial rights of individuals or are they required for continuity of operations? Some of these questions would become the decision points in our flowchart. At the same time, we looked at the different endpoint repositories and brainstormed what each system could and could not do. On the slide, you see our early attempt to define Google Drive's capabilities. We quickly came to understand that we needed much more information about the capabilities of different repositories. So while we tried to figure out how to accommodate all these different pieces of criteria in the flowchart, we did additional research, speaking with both our network administrators and our Google IT project manager. Our flowchart iterations quickly became a pack of flying monkeys. We went through iteration after iteration after iteration, trying to capture the complexities of consultations in the simplest workable form. We began in one program, but were changing versions so frequently that we had to switch to another so we could edit them on the fly as we were meeting. We spent many a meeting just trying to determine the order of the decision points was the single most important decision point that would serve as the opening question. Was it whether or not records were essential or whether or not they had protected information or how long they were retained or how secure they needed to be? Finally, we determined that the first question was actually much simpler. We needed to ask if the files the user was asking about were even records at all. After all, if the user was asking about duplicates of official records or electronic files that were not records, the conclusion was obvious. They could put them wherever worked best for them. We ran through the various past case studies with the different flowcharts until it also became readily apparent that each case possessed its own nuances, which were not being captured. Trying to capture all of those different nuances of business use would bloat our flowchart beyond utility. Some of the case studies even resulted in multiple endpoints. Choices often did not follow a yes-no path, but rather an if-then kind of flow. 
the flowchart simply oversimplified the situation. So we began to think of other ways to capture all the different decision points, rescuing ourselves from the idea that the flowchart was the be all and end all to this solution. Lauren is back to tell you more about that. We went back to the drawing board, literally. We revisited those case studies we'd created from previous conversations with record owners. What were the questions we asked during those conversations and why didn't they translate into an obvious flowchart? And we had an epiphany. We knew we needed to identify and include characteristics of record. There were obvious cases when it was clearly inappropriate to store certain records in certain repositories. For example, we wouldn't store archival, permanent archival records in Google, and we wouldn't store short-term records in our digital preservation system. When we think about records characteristics, we're able to narrow down our options pretty easily. We also knew we needed to describe the functionality of the systems. However, we realized that what we were actually describing were the ways that users interact with their records, which is based on available functionality. The combination of these two sets of characteristics is what made it impossible to use a flowchart, too numerous to depict as a branching tree, and impossible to weight or score against each other. We realized a matrix could bring all these characteristics and functionality into a format where a user would be able to compare across multiple possible repositories. We realized the process was similar to tools used by shoppers to review options. Let's say you're shopping for a new car. You know you have a spending limit, so that instantly eliminates some options that are out of your price range. And maybe you have a minimum miles per gallon in mind. Lastly, you know it must be all wheel drive. While this has narrowed down the list of possible cars, it still hasn't provided you with one option. You no longer have make or break criteria. So at this point, you are really left with cars that meet your needs, but have different advantages and disadvantages. So what is most important to you? A roof, electric lift gate, or amazing stereo? How could we build something similar for determining where to store records? And how could we help users narrow it down from multiple similar options to just one ideal choice, we realized that our tool could be a combination of a flowchart and a matrix. Step one was to build the flowchart. We knew from our epiphany that records characteristics worked well as a flowchart, but which questions should we include? We determined there were four critical questions with clear yes or no answers that tended to have the biggest impact. These were the questions that helped us to quickly rule out inappropriate options. So is it a record? Does it have long-term retention? Does it contain protected information? Is it an essential record? By answering these four questions and following the flowchart, you'd end up with seven possible endpoints, and each endpoint represents multiple appropriate options based on the responses. To get to the single best repository, the user would go to the endpoint's corresponding matrix in order to compare and contrast the functionality and interactivity of each repository and determine what would best meet their needs. Step one was to build a flowchart, so step two was to create a matrix for each of those endpoints that would include the system functionality and user interactivity that did not work in the flowchart. We needed something that would allow us to easily compare and contrast multiple repositories, but still be flexible enough to apply to any record situation. The flowchart took us from nine cars down to three, and the matrix would take us from three cars down to one, but where to start? So a quick note, uh, the following sets of screenshots are for illustrative purposes only and are therefore too small to read. So we're happy to provide the list on request. To build our matrices, we started by listing system functionality, the second set of characteristics from our epiphany. We asked ourselves, what are the features specific to that system and what are the functions it cannot perform? For example, we listed items like version control, Boolean searching, and built-in retention management. The list for each system was extensive, so we went through and sorted the items into categories. The categories were loosely based on NARA's universal electronic records management requirements and ARMA's generally accepted record keeping principles, among other resources. 
We saw that sometimes the same item was listed in multiple ways. So this categorization allowed us to consolidate the items into a more manageable list and helped us to identify anything that was missing. Next, we organized the list by category and added any additional potential desired or required functionality from the user perspective, the third set of characteristics from our epiphany. For example, users might want to be able to drag and drop files. By thinking about the desired functionality from the user's point of view in terms of interactivity rather than system capability, we, will, we were able to identify anything that we missed when we looked at it from just the system perspective. Since the idea was to indicate repository capabilities, we realized that we had to normalize the items in the list into question format where the answer was always either yes or no. For example, the functionality version control became, does it have version control? We went through line by line to update all functionality and interactivity into yes, no question format. We populated everything into a spreadsheet. We listed the possible repositories across the top. We listed the system functionality and desired user interactivity in the left-hand column. We went through row by row using symbols to indicate if each system was capable of performing or accommodating each function or interactive item. We discovered that there were some instances where the answer was yes, but, so we marked those with the caution icon and made a note. A common scenario was that a function was possible but could only be performed by an IT administrator. We felt that a yes in that case would be misleading because it requires assistance from someone else. So a caution seemed more appropriate. Once we filled out the entire grid, we duplicated it for each endpoint from our flowchart and included only those repositories that were appropriate for each set of questions and answers. The matrices vary from two possible repositories to six. We knew that we wanted to use filtering to make the tool user friendly. We worked on the formatting until we finally settled on something that would be useful for us, then continue to rework it until we felt we had something that could be used by people outside our group. Up to this point, the understanding was that the tool would only be used by a small set of employees that work closely with us on records matters, not by a general audience. These are mostly colleagues in IT and records liaisons whose role is to help users navigate systems. For this reason, we refer to it by the very unofficial name IT tool, even though it's not strictly for IT users. To do that, we made sure that the results were printer friendly. We also made sure that multiple users could access the tool without impacting other users. The majority of our organization uses enterprise Google, so we use Google Sheets for easier access via hyperlinks rather than requiring downloading files or sharing via email. We created a glossary and step-by-step -step instructions. We checked all our questions using a readability tool, checked all the colors for adequate contrast, and made sure it could be used without relying on the colors by using distinct shapes for the icons. And without further ado, we will provide a demonstration of the tool. We start by clicking the link to the flowchart provided in the instructions. The flowchart includes definitions along with a link to the accompanying glossary. Let's say that a user has come to us because they have an application that creates a set of records and they want to know the best place to store them. We begin at the top by asking, are they the official copy? The user tells us yes, and we move to the next question. Do they have long-term or short-term retention? After consulting the retention schedule, we determine that they have a retention period of five years, so we follow the short-term branch of the flowchart. Next, we ask if they contain protected information like PII. The answer is no, so we continue to the last question on this branch, are they essential? The user says, yes, we need them for continuity of operations. That brings us to endpoint E. We click on endpoint E and it takes us 
to the corresponding matrix. As you can see, that particular set of questions and answers has provided three acceptable repositories for storing this user's records. So now we can help them compare and contrast. All the functionality and interactivity is listed on the left. We gather those that are most desirable to the user and use the filter to narrow it down. We're able to type in keywords or scroll through the list. Our user would be able, would prefer to be able to customize metadata, search using keywords, disable the ability to download, collaborate in real time, enable version control, use workflows, send email notifications, and of course, apply retention rules. After adding all the desired items, we click OK and are presented with a much more manageable list, including any notes. We can now print this out or save as a PDF so that the user can take it with them. They can also use this to compare with the original system that creates the records. Their user is able to make a storage decision with all of the pertinent information in front of them. They're able to make decisions and balance their needs with the best available options without wasting any time considering repositories that are inappropriate. Now that you've seen the tool, I'll hand it back over to Deidre to talk about the outcomes of user testing and our next step to further develop the tool into something that could be used by anyone. Thank you, Lauren. Now that you've seen the final IT tool, and how it works, we wanted to walk you through the outcomes and impacts of the project, as well as the work there is left to do. We arrived at the gates of the Emerald City, so to speak, and in order to unlock them, we needed to get some feedback from outside the project team so that we didn't continue to try and improve the tool without input from those we hoped would use it. We selected one of our IT business system analysts and a program communication specialist from our asset management group whose job includes records responsibilities. We'd advise both these people on various records issues over the years and asked if they'd be willing to try the tool out and provide us with their thoughts. From both, we hoped to hear that the tool would be useful when they were speaking with county users about where to store things. We also requested their likes and dislikes about the tool. We didn't provide a lot of setup information for our testers simply asked them if they'd be willing to take a look. And then if they said yes, we provided them with the tool instructions on the left, which contained links to the glossary seen at the right. The glossary was specifically included because we'd come to understand that people often use the same terms to mean very different things, especially between IT and records. For example, we knew at the beginning of the project that much of the staff at the county referred to sending inactive records to the record center as, quote, archiving them, which causes difficulty when you're trying to differentiate archival processes and systems from records processes and systems. The initial feedback we received was good, stating that the flowchart and the linking between each element of the tool worked well in Google. We heard that, quote, the result was very clear and easy to make sense of, end quote, and that our user would be comfortable sharing them with, quote, program managers and the like, end quote. One tester had some issues with the readability on the Google Sheet for the matrices, which would have to be worked on. But the largest issue seemed to be with filtering the matrices in the Google Sheet and was a result of Google's functionality rather than our design. As you've seen, on the sheet itself, the questions are arranged thematically. However, when you click to filter, the questions are arranged alphabetically. It was difficult to switch between the two arrangements to locate the filters the tester was looking for. Additionally, if you happen to click outside that filter box, say to see something in the glossary, Google doesn't save your prior selections in that filter. We set to work on some repairs creating a checkbox to the left of each question. So a user could filter by only the checked questions. In other words, see the systems with the functionality they needed for their business use. 
The only sticking point with this solution was that there was no way to easily clear all those selections and start over again if you wanted to make different choices or examine different records. We were aware that Google Sheets had the ability to incorporate scripting, and this proved to be the solution to our dilemma. In our latest version of the tool, as you can see in the video, our user can select the criteria most relevant to their records and business needs, and then apply a filter to narrow the choices down to systems that possess that functionality. This filtered criteria is then able to be printed or saved to PDF if they need. Once they have completed their analysis, they can click on the scripted clear all button to remove the check marks and then undo the filter to return to the full sheet of choices. In this way, the sheet is reusable for many different customers and record situations. While still imperfect, we hope that this addresses the original critique when we send the tool out for the next round of testing. Now that we'd reached the Emerald City, even if we hadn't yet reached Oz himself, we checked in on our original goals to make sure the tool was repeatable and consistent, flexible and scalable, easy and efficient, and would empower users. Although the project team thought that it was, we needed to test the tool again with a broader audience to be certain. We also wanted to align our project with the county's values as much as possible. We realized along the way that the whole project was an effort to reduce bias in record keeping. That is, if we gave clear and consistent advice that could be applied to multiple types and sizes of records cases, while being easy enough for end users to utilize, the selection of records being retained long-term and permanently relied much less on perceived importance and much more on consistent decision-making and good records management practices. So where do we go from here? After all, we reached the Emerald City, but we haven't yet had our audience with the Wizard of Oz. The tool is not yet in use. We are collecting additional feedback from other test users to make final improvements to the IT tool. We are also currently working on a redesign of our intranet website known as Commons, where we envision this tool living in an electronic record section for staff to be able to use. While putting it in a central, familiar location, and by preventing copies, we hope to be able to update the tool as needed when new system functionality is discovered or implemented. Finally, we'd learn from other projects that records end users, county staff outside of IT or record specific functions, respond really well to learning via games and quizzes. So we are resolved to create an end user tool that functions like the IT tool, but is more interactive and fun. After that, we will bring the project to the close, about three years since its inception. Although the end user tool is not finished in time to show to you, we can share a bit about our development process for this as well. On the slide, you see our brainstorming. We reasoned that there needed to be a different tool for end users to better facilitate different learning styles. We also knew that tables, like spreadsheets, aren't terribly friendly for assistive device users and we support the county's digital accessibility goals. So we hope to produce the tool in an alternative format, giving end users a choice to determine which they'd like to use. Words like quiz style, gamification, and interactive learning dominated our thoughts. At the same time, we had been discussing an authoring tool for creating online records education. So we combined the two needs and began to evaluate programs. We began with authoring systems that had been successful elsewhere in the county and amongst professional colleagues and contacts. During our evaluations of three different systems, we not tested not only their applicability for online education, but also their ease of use and functionality that could be applied to the end user tool. We wanted something that would not have a huge learning curve to use since we were eager to get our tool designed and published for the benefit of county staff. We looked at multiple products. Some of the functionality we were seeking was the ability to create interactivity, the ability to create branching logic, preloaded templates, non-binary endpoints, and digital accessibility features. As a result of our testing, we identified a system that would be suitable to build our end user tool. 
The project team now consists of just two, myself and Lauren, but we look forward to translating the IT tool into an end user tool as time elapses. Through it all, we learned that there's not a single solution to this issue. We hope you enjoyed seeing what our project produced and that there are some useful lessons here for others that exist in complex and unregimented records environments. We encountered challenges with technological limitations in our Google environment and challenges with our decentralized records environment, but hope this project and the tools that result from it can be used to assist county with developing best practices for all the public records it creates and stores. And we didn't forget about those SAS systems either. We're working on a project with IT to help those records questions be answered prior to system builds or procurement. Their new form for submitting software to be evaluated now contains a question about whether the system will hold public records, which is a huge win for us. Now, we are most definitely not Oz, the great and terrible, but we are happy to gather around and answer any questions you might have for us. Thank you. All right, thank you. This was even more wow than the first time. <laughs> um, we can open this up for questions. If anybody has some, um, I you can put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask our speakers a question. And I should turn me back on. There we go. All right. This was great. Um, I know the 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 common question, perpetual question, is how did you guys get a seat at the IT table? What's the magic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did, did the wizard help you out with that? Oh, I mean, being persistent. Yeah. <laughs> when I, when I, I started at the county about a little over five years ago, and so somebody who was already on the team had really put in a lot of effort to build relationships and, and just try to to get into meetings, even just as an observer, not even necessarily like a subject matter expert, but just can I can I come along? And I think um, you know that really that really helped. And then um, I think just trying to find allies. <laughs> it's a big our IT division is really big, and so um, we I think we were able to really find people who understood. I, I guess that's really what happened was that there were people within IT who kind of, I guess, already had just an innate records kind of understanding. And so then once they figured out that we existed and they had somebody to talk about um, their concerns with, that's things that they were thinking of, but that maybe the rest of their division wasn't thinking about, um, they were able to bring us in and kind of point to us as, as being you know, people with knowledge that can, can help. And then from there, the more that we just talk about being compliant, <laughs> I think the more people's attention that we can get. I don't know. What do you think, Deidre? Like, how do you, because you've even, you've taken it even further than that, because I think right at the time that we, um, that you came to the county, it was right when we were ready to kind of really insert you into all these different places, like go forth and, and really take our program even further. Yeah, and I speak up a lot in meetings, for better or for worse, no one's told me to shut up yet, so <laughs> I feel free to interject whenever there's a records issue that I think isn't being addressed. Um, in the SHRAG meeting, we raise hands and I do it verbally. Um, in the project governance meeting, because that's a bit more formal a meeting, um, I will take down the name of the person that's in charge of the project and then contact them by email afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's not necessarily in front of the whole group if there's something that they needed to think about that they hadn't been thinking about when they're thinking of building a system or um, even during acquisition of, of large systems. Um, so I think in general too that our profile has just grown at the county in the last few years where we've mostly I'm not going to say entirely, but mostly gotten people to stop thinking of records as boxes in the warehouse in the records center, mostly. So they're kind of including us on more things now. And actually, we get people from IT working on various projects that actually do reach out now and, and say, is there something I need to be concerned of in this project and share their project charters with us? So it's it's been a really slow process, but it started to, to develop really well over time. 
Yeah, and I, I think we've also been able to get to the table through, um, through our privacy group. So I'm our representative for, um, on, our, on our county's privacy oversight committee, which brings together lots of different people from different departments. And, you know, there's so much overlap because privacy is about risk as well. And so being part of that group, then when something comes up, they, they know that I exist or that we, ex our group exists. And so if they're participating in something and then they, they hear, they hear something like, Ooh, you know, I think that maybe we should bring Lauren and her team in, then they'll connect us that way. So I think through the, the privacy group, it's been another really, uh, really important one. If anybody has something similar. Wow. Okay, um, I have a question in chat here. Have you found a system function that is important to the users that you didn't think about when you were developing the tool? Hmm, that's a hard one. I think, I don't think that any particular system function that we didn't think of sort of emerged in our work, um, but what it really did highlight for me is that we think about the way that records and systems interact and people interact. It's different from, from users. And so I think that it just really highlighted that, you know, uh, when we talk to, to people about, well, you know, it sounds like these only have a three-year retention. So, you know, they obviously don't need to go into our preservation system. So let's really talk about what's important to you. And, and so I think through those conversations, you start hearing about just the way that people like to be able to, to work with their records. And I think from our perspective, we're, we focus much more on um, compliance and best practices and standards. And those are the, that was really where the epiphany came from. There were two, those are two different perspectives. And so there wasn't any one particular thing, but just um, I think listening to users and asking them how they like to find their records, how they like to what do they do when they like to save them or share them, things like that? Yeah, and I, I will say that the tool isn't hugely widely available yet because it's not up on the website yet. I, I expect we'll get some of those once it's more widely available. Um, it's also the case that because we use Google as an enterprise uh, customer, Google changes things all the time, like daily. Um, so there are things on that tool that will go away. There are new things that will come up. Um, and that's why it was important for us to make the tool flexible enough to change over time. And also why we wanted to prevent people from downloading a copy of that tool. Because we didn't want them to be working on old information. We wanted them to always go back to the theoretically the most updated version of the tool. Anybody else with a question? Well, I have another one. <laughs> I, I guess you were not part of the massive move just pre-pandemic to go Office 365. No, no? We've heard oh, lots aren't about you it. lucky? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, You're lucky because that creates a whole nother can of worms, mm -hmm. or opens a whole nother can of worms. Yeah. And I should say that I think the first time we gave this presentation, I don't know if we highlighted this enough, but um, that we, not all of not all of the county does use Google. So um, in order for it to be widely usable, we do actually have a non-Google version. And so it doesn't rely on having Google. It really is just as long as you can have something like a word processor. So you could use, you know, Microsoft. So as long as you have a a way to make a document and a way to make a spreadsheet and then some way to connect the two to each other. That's really all it is. It's just sort of text document plus a spreadsheet that has, and they each have their own built-in functionality. Um, let's see, someone said, someone else has asked in the chat. So how do you cope with any changes in <laughs> Google that may undermine your tool? Oh, <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> yeah, we call it the O oh, Google. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it happens, you know, there are things, the functionality that they take away with that we would rather they didn't. Um, and, and the key is just flexibility. We just have to roll with it. But I will say that if they change certain things drastically enough, the recommendations for Google would have more red X's on it. 
So mm -hmm. if they took away functionality that was really important to people or really important for records, um, the idea is you get to that end set of the tool, you can see a couple of appropriate places, but hopefully you're gonna pick the one that has the most green check marks. So if Google changes functionality that is a negative change in our perception, you're just gonna see more red Xs in that Google column. And you know, ultimately because we're not a centralized records environment, it is up to the user whether they decide to follow that advice our role is to just give them the best advice that we have. Right. So how often do you go in and check the functionality of the Google Docs? Oh. I mean, that's that's got to be a full time job right there. Yeah, we uh. tend not to do it, um, but we have a they call it Monday minute that highlights often changes that are coming in Google or that Google has released so we can keep track that way. And we also have a very good relationship with uh, our Google administrator. So um, mm -hmm. when we talk to him, he'll mention if something's coming up that would have an impact on records. So mm -hmm. it's, it's informal right now. It is hard to keep up though. I'm not going to be shy about saying that. What, unlike Microsoft who kind of has planned releases and tells you all about the functionality that's coming in a new release, Google things just appear and disappear without warning, seemingly. I suppose if you tracked their documentation like our administrator does, you would be more aware of it. But we we kind of rely on that person for that expertise. Yeah, it, it is tough because they have some rapid releases. So they do have a, they have a roadmap, but then they'll just suddenly change something because, um, you know, somebody decided that it was really important and it, it could have impact. So we just try to, we try to keep up and that's not even just specific to the tool that's um that's that's everywhere where we have google things will just suddenly disappear um or change or an option that you used to have isn't there anymore and so i think that the the county at least the users that use google um have have gotten they don't like it but i think we've gotten used to this just constant change and something may not function the way that it does so um, we, do, I think that we haven't formalized, um, and I could be wrong, um, Deidre can correct me, but I don't think we've really formalized a, a schedule for going through the tool to make sure things are updated only because it's still in testing phase. We still have not launched sort of the final version of it. And I think once we do that, then we will be much better at going through and making sure that it stays accurate. But because right now we're still mostly testing the way that it works and getting feedback from the people who will be using it, we haven't paid as much attention to making sure that the, the check marks and the X's are still, um, are still accurate. But we do know that that's one of the things to keep in mind when you build something like this is that you do have to dedicate people to keeping it updated. Otherwise, it becomes useless and, and very, very confusing. All right. Okay, we have five minutes left of our hour. If there's any other questions, we'd be happy to take them. I assume. <laughs> All right, let me see here. I'd also gonna... just be interested in knowing if people found it, found it useful or interesting. It's always good to hear feedback. Well, you've heard mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a thumbs up from Rachel. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> Anybody else want to chime in? Uh, are, are you seeing the chat? Deidre and Lauren, you're... Are yes. you watching chat? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I don't have to read them all to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, and we do have, um, uh, as we did the first time we gave the presentation, we do have shareable versions that we um, we can give to the group, uh, you know, wherever you're going to post it so that you can customize it. And if you do use it, do be sure to customize it because again, the the check marks and the X's uh, for what is and isn't possible is very, very specific to our environment and what our administrators have turned on and off and allowed. Um, so don't, it's not out of the box. You will have to go through and, and make sure that it's, it's accurate for your situation at your institution. Okay. 
Anybody else? Well, evidently when I shared my screen last time, I didn't put it into the correct mode. So I'm afraid to open my, share my screen again. Um, but I definitely wanna thank our two speakers. Um, an impressive amount of work. And um, I believe we're going to be getting a copy of this to put up on the COSA website so that you can go back and, and look at it and listen to it again. Um, and don't forget our next webinar, which is in April on file formats. Really interesting presentation about how this person has been researching the formats and coming up with a sort of a matrix, I assume, um, of what's more endangered than another form of software, I think. I may be wrong, but I think that was good. All right, anything else? Well, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. And everybody have a terrific afternoon. <laughs>